Hello, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing endometriosis. In brief, endometriosis is the presence of estrogen-sensitive endometrial tissue somewhere in the body other than the uterus. The severity of the disease can range from asymptomatic to debilitating. It is the most common cause of chronic pelvic pain in women and a significant cause of infertility. The location of endometriosis can be subdivided into intrapelvic versus extrapelvic disease, with the former being much more common. Intrapelvic endometriosis can be further subdivided into ovarian endometriomas, which are a type of ovarian cyst caused by an endometrial implant on the ovary. There is superficial peritoneal endometriosis, in which an endometrial tissue is found on the surfaces of the peritoneal cavity and intraperitoneal structures. And there is deep infiltrating endometriosis, which can occur in the intestines, urinary tract, including the bladder, the uterosacral ligament, and vagina. Deep infiltrating endometriosis can cause substantial fibrosis and can form mass-like lesions. And last, extrapelvic endometriosis is rare, with the most commonly described sites being the diaphragm, pleura, and lungs, though many others have been reported. Most women with endometriosis have multiple sites of ectopic tissue. Let's discuss the clinical presentation. The classic presentation of endometriosis is a woman in her mid to late 20s presenting with cyclic pelvic pain occurring with menses, in which case it can be labeled dysmenorrhea. However, some women don't have this classic presentation and instead have chronic, consistent, non-cyclical pain that can be diagnostically more challenging. Some women experience dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse. Women with endometriosis can experience unusually heavy or prolonged menstrual bleeding, known as menorrhagia. And as mentioned earlier, endometriosis is a relatively common cause of infertility. Then there are the less common or less commonly discussed manifestations. These include chronic low back pain, various forms of bladder and bowel dysfunction, most notably painful defecation, and more rarely chest pain and hemoptysis from endometrial tissue within the lungs. In addition to these direct features, endometriosis is also associated with fatigue, anxiety, and depression. Overall, it leads to significant disruptions to patient social and professional lives, including challenges with interpersonal relationships and significant economic loss through decreased productivity. This very wide spectrum of manifestations, many of which are unknown to some clinicians, is why a common disease like endometriosis needs to be included in this series on underappreciated diseases. Although a significant minority of women with endometriosis experience infertility, among women who do become pregnant, there are some important clinical manifestations during pregnancy. First, since symptoms of endometriosis are worsened at times of menstruation, symptoms are overall much improved during pregnancy when menstruation does not occur. However, endometriosis does increase the risk of a number of obstetric complications, including preterm birth, miscarriage, a condition called placenta previa, in which the placenta partially or totally covers the cervix, which is the outlet from the uterus, a general need for cesarean delivery, and ectopic pregnancy, which is when a non-viable pregnancy occurs outside of the uterus, for example, in the fallopian tubes or peritoneal cavity. The pathogenesis of endometriosis is incompletely understood, but appears to be multifactorial. It's generally accepted that the most common mechanism for developing intrapelvic endometriosis is when endometrial tissue shed during menstruation travels retrograde from the uterine cavity backwards through the fallopian tubes and into the peritoneal cavity. Extrapelvic endometriosis is thought to partially occur due to hematogenous or lymphatic embolization of endometrial cells. Regardless of the mechanism, the consequence is an estrogen-dependent chronic inflammation in the anatomic locations where the shed endometrial tissue ends up. The infertility observed in endometriosis is also multifactorial, including chronic inflammation of the peritoneum, hormonal imbalances, concurrent dysfunction of the intrauterine endometrium, anatomic abnormalities such as pelvic adhesions, and decreased frequency of sexual intercourse due to dyspareunia. Risk factors for endometriosis include anything that increases the number of menstrual cycles a woman experiences. This includes being nulla gravid or nulla paris, 
meaning no history of pregnancy or having given birth respectively. It also includes early menarche and or late menopause and a relatively short menstrual cycle. Other risk factors include a tendency towards heavy menstrual bleeding and a family history of endometriosis. When it comes to the diagnosis, in some women, it's not challenging. If, and this is a big if, the woman has the so-called classic presentation of being in her mid to late 20s, presenting with painful menses and an ovarian mass, plus or minus infertility. Unfortunately, most presentations don't conform to this classic archetype, leading to a delayed diagnosis of years for many patients, partly because these non-classic presentations can mimic many other diseases. Historically, a definitive diagnosis of endometriosis required surgical biopsy with histological confirmation under the microscope. But with modern imaging techniques, such as transvaginal ultrasound and MRI, diagnosis can now often be made through the combination of history, exam, and consistent radiographic findings. Lab tests currently have no role in diagnosing endometriosis other than helping to rule out competing diagnoses. In addition, a failure of symptoms to improve at all after hormonal therapy that successfully stops menstruation is evidence against the presence of endometriosis, though this is not sufficient on its own to discount the diagnosis. When it comes to the differential diagnosis of endometriosis, that is, the set of other diseases which can present similarly, it depends on which symptom or symptoms the patient is predominantly experiencing. If the patient is experiencing dysmenorrhea, competing diagnoses include adenomyosis, which is a disease characterized by the infiltration of endometrial tissue into the myometrium, the muscular outer layer of the uterus. To complicate diagnosis, endometriosis and adenomyosis often coexist. Other common considerations are uterine fibroids and primary dysmenorrhea, the latter of which refers to dysmenorrhea that occurs in the absence of any anatomically demonstrable cause. Chronic pelvic pain can be alternatively caused by ovarian cysts, pelvic inflammatory disease, pelvic adhesions, fibroids, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, interstitial cystitis, which is a form of non-infectious inflammation of the bladder, abdominal wall myofascial pain, and cutaneous nerve entrapment. Dysperunia can be from various anatomic abnormalities, vaginal dryness, PID and sexually transmitted infections, as the consequence of obstetric surgery and perineal injury, such as tears sustained during childbirth, and psychosocial issues including sexual abuse. And infertility can alternatively be from adhesions, PID, fibroids, polycystic ovary syndrome, various endocrine disorders such as thyroid disease and prolactin-secreting pituitary tumors, intense exercise, and eating disorders. In addition, women with endometriosis who present with prominent urinary symptoms are frequently mistook for having interstitial cystitis, and those who present with prominent bowel symptoms are mistook for having IBS, an anal fissure, or just plain constipation. When it comes to the treatment of endometriosis, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. It depends on a woman's specific symptoms, her age, her reproductive plans, and her risk tolerance for medical and surgical options. For example, the approach could be drastically different in a 30-year-old nulliparous woman who has been unsuccessfully trying to conceive versus a 40-year-old woman with three children in whom preservation of fertility is not a concern. On the whole, treatment should be framed around what the patient is experiencing rather than the specific distribution of ectopic tissue. Very generally, treatments fall into three categories. First is hormonal therapy, which has the goal of suppressing ovulation and menstruation. This is usually done with conventional contraceptives, either combined estrogen progesterone, or sometimes just continuous progesterone, depending on side effects. If these are insufficient or not tolerated, other hormonal options include GnRH analogs and IUDs. The second category of treatment is general analgesia. NSAIDs are the first line for most patients. For individuals in whom NSAIDs and hormonal treatments are ineffective or insufficient, referral to a pain clinic experienced in the management of chronic pelvic pain should be considered. The last option is surgery, usually performed laparoscopically. 
surgery is usually reserved either for women who continue to have symptoms despite the aforementioned medical therapy or for women who have an immediate desire for pregnancy. Surgery may be conservative in which only the ectopic endometrial tissue is targeted, either with ablation or excision, or surgery may be definitive in which the uterus plus or minus ovaries are removed entirely to reduce the risk of recurrence. The success and complication rates vary depending on the approach and location and number of sites of ectopic tissue. In particularly severe cases, resection of deeply infiltrating endometriosis may require bowel or bladder resection. And even after surgery, ongoing hormonal suppression is often necessary for continued and durable pain relief and for the prevention of recurrence. Some women try acupuncture or dietary changes as additional treatments. However, the current data is insufficient to recommend these at this time. Finally, there is prognosis. Although it would seem that definitive surgery would definitively cure endometriosis, it's generally considered a chronic, non-curable disease, since recurrence of symptoms is common even after removal of the uterus and ectopic endometrial implants. However, treatments are largely effective at controlling symptoms, and between surgery and assisted reproductive technology, many women who were previously unable to become pregnant are able to do so. That's it for this brief introduction to endometriosis. If you found it interesting or helpful, please consider subscribing to Strong Medicine and checking out other videos in this series on underappreciated diseases.